So in September last year, I took what's becoming something of a habit, uh, a small trip to the United States. The main aim was actually to attend, to attend the Historical Naval Ships Association Conference, which was happening uh, back in New York State uh, in association with USS Slater. But, you know, if I'm going to travel all the way across the Atlantic, you've got to go and visit a few other things as well, you know, make the trip worthwhile. And I started out on the opposite side of the country in Washington State, in Bremerton specifically, and you've already seen the product of my stay there once on the channel, the second interview with Captain Larry Sequist. And there's another thing that we saw in Bremerton, which is the Puget Sound Naval Museum. That will be coming up in a month or two. But as you may spot on the left hand side, this is actually a reflection taken from inside a room. This was the view from my hotel room. You know, it doesn't get much better for a naval historian than seeing a full museum ship just waiting for you outside. This is, of course, USS Turner Joy, a Forest German class destroyer. And the crew who run her were kind enough to allow me access to the ship to show you guys around at least some of it and talk about some of her systems, etc. And of course, there were a fair few of you guys who actually showed up to say hi as well. Uh, you won't obviously see them during the video for reasons of privacy outside of maybe a couple of shoes or something like that. Uh, but hello to those of you who were there. Uh, it was great to meet you all. And, you know, at some point, who knows, I may ever may at some point end up back in Washington state, but that will be for the future. Uh, for now, however, let's commence looking around this wonderfully preserved destroyer. Hello, everybody, and welcome aboard USS Turner Joy. She is a Forrest Sherman class destroyer, the last gun destroyer class of the US Navy and moreover Turner Joy herself is the last of the Forest Shermans. So since their design concept sort of just about started in 1949 these are also the latest ships pretty much that the US Navy ever designed and actually built which would get covered by the channel. So we're going to take a look around her but as always we're going to start off with the main armament. And there's one of them behind me, as you can see. So let's go and have a look at that a bit closer up. Well, now the seagulls are happy to let us continue. This is one of three main guns aboard the Turner Joy. This is a 5-inch 54 caliber weapon. So this is the weapon that was actually... Will you quiet down? Thank you. This is the weapon that was developed to actually replace the 5-inch 38 in US service. As the name suggests, 54 calibers long, so considerably longer barrel despite having the same caliber of shell. And although you can't see it nowadays because one of them's been removed, you can see one on the right. This is a lookout position for fire control. And there'll be another one here that's now been terminated. And one of these is for anti-surface, the other is for anti-air. And let the seagulls calm down themselves down a bit. Now, apart from having a longer barrel, what else is special about the 5-inch 54? Well, it's designed as an auto-loading weapon, which means it can fire at a significantly higher rate than the 5-inch 38, which is still hand-loaded. And that means that you don't need quite as many of them. So if you think about to the previous full class run of US destroyers, the gearings, they had three turrets, or three mounts more accurately, of 5-inch 38, and those were obviously twin mounts, so six guns but their rate of fire, depending on the crew, depending on the circumstances, is somewhere between 12 and 15 rounds a minute, more typically. These things are designed to do 40 rounds a minute. So a quick bit of math will tell you that a single gun mount of these can actually put more shells down range per minute than a twin 5-inch 38 can. And so it was decided during the design process that you could, they were going to retain the three mounts, but by going down to a single gun per mount, the Turner Joy and the Forest Shermans in general would still have a higher rate of fire than a six-gun gearing. But, of course, with all the autoloader adding weight, the single barrel meant that the total weight of this mount was still within acceptable parameters for a destroyer of the period. The Forest Shermans are quite large for destroyers of the period. They're 2,800 tons standard before you get up to full loading. But even at well over 400 foot long, there is a limit to how much weight you can put on a destroyer up top, especially when it comes to big heavy things like your main guns. And of course, 
since this is an immediate post-war destroyer, it's got a lot more radar and communications devices and all sorts of other equipment that you will have a look at a little bit later. The other thing that you'll notice as we go on is that unlike the gearings, which have a pair of twin mounts super firing forward and a single mount aft, the Forrest Shermans just have the one mount forward and the two super guns which are super firing are both positioned aft. Now there is a reason for that but we'll have a look at that when we get to the aft positions for these guns. The other thing that you may or may not be able to see in this particular shot is that there's a very steep rise of the bow. This is because obviously you don't want your ship to be extremely tall out of the water that'll make it hilariously unstable but on a relatively speaking small ship like a destroyer that would mean if you go through into high seas you're going to be getting water green over the bows all the time. So to obviate that if you've been aboard something like an Iowa class battleship for example you'll notice that there's quite a steep rise from the main deck all the way up to the bow. Well trust me on this ship that rise is even steeper because you've got a similar level of change in height but happening over a much shorter distance. And here we have one of the ship's two sets of torpedo launchers. Now these are not the original ones the ship was launched with. The Forest Shermans were originally conceived with two pairs of twin launchers. That's a bit redundant, isn't it? So yeah, two twin launchers for 21 inch torpedoes, so regular size for a World War II or post-World War II torpedo, but they were fixed. Now you might think, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> fixed torpedoes, surely they went the way of the dodo back with the torpedo boats. Well, the thing was that the torpedoes they were planning to launch were not Mark 15 anti-surface torpedoes, which ran in a straight line. They were Mark 35 anti-submarine torpedoes with acoustic guidance, at which point the thought went that, well, if they're acoustically guided, they can change their own course. They don't need to be on a swiveling mount. And what that swiveling mount meant, if you've had a look at older museum destroyers, like the many Fletchers that are around in the US, is a huge amount of space on the center line had to be cleared because you had <laughs> and now there's a heron <laughs> oh dear and what that meant was that a huge amount of space on the center line had to be cleared to allow these massive quintuple or sometimes quadruple torpedo launchers to swing all the way around space was at a premium even on a destroyer this size and so they thought well if we have two fixed sets of launchers, that should be fine. However, as time and technology went on, they didn't go back to anti-surface torpedoes, but they did find that the fixed, uh, there's a wasp. <laughs> as time went on, they didn't want to go back to the anti-surface torpedo mode, but they did find that the fixed launchers did have a little bit of a problem, which was that the early acoustic homing devices, they still needed to have the target in something approximating a forward cone, which meant if there was a submarine behind you and your torpedo launch was facing forward, you'd have to turn the entire ship around, which wasn't particularly brilliant. And so when the time came to rearm the ship later on, it got a pair of these triple torpedo launchers and these torpedoes are smaller Mark 44s and as you can tell from the pedestal here this is a Mark 32 Mod 5 mount and this can be swilled obviously the safety rails wouldn't have actually been in place at that point so the ship went from having four torpedoes to six and these could be much more easily aimed and because they were lighter they're also much easier to reload the torpedo launchers would have been in exactly the same position and you can actually see another element of this whole system which is this little king post crane here which would allow them to take torpedoes straight off of the dock side if they'd expended them and put them in the launchers. You can see a reload rail has been put here so you can see a torpedo body partially inserted into the upper tube and just over here they have another torpedo open for examination and it's notable to see not just that this torpedo is a lot narrower than a full-size 21-inch torpedo, but also how much shorter it is, because it's not supposed to go 20, 30,000 yards and take out a capital ship. It's only got to have enough fuel to go after a submarine, and with early 1950s sonar, with the best will in the world, you weren't going to detect a submarine at that range anyway, so you didn't need all the fuel, because you're going to be launching at pretty close range in the first place. Now, with apologies for some slightly uh, wobbly camera work, because I'm having to stick this camera out on a tripod, 
because you can't access these particular areas of the ship, there are a pair of weapon systems that were aboard the ship when she was launched that have been removed. We're going to have a look at the mounting point for another one of them in a bit better detail later on. But the two systems that are no longer aboard the ship are twin three-inch automatic anti-aircraft guns. There were two mounts for those and a pair of modified hedgehog depth charge launchers. The hedgehogs, of course, being miniature depth chargers or a head throwing weapons. Now these days you can see we've got the original bridge structure and then this slightly covered open bridge or semi-open bridge which we'll look at in a minute. But this area just here that you can see that's currently fenced off by the blue panelling, that was the forward mounting point for the forward twin three inch anti-aircraft gun. And then if I can stick this out over here, this area, you can probably still see a few of the mounting points left, is where one of those hedgehog launchers would have been placed. The other one obviously would be counterpart on the starboard side. Now this all bears into consideration that this vessel was not designed as a fleet destroyer in the classic sense, the way the fletchers and the gearings were with surface guns to take on enemy destroyers and to torpedoes to take on enemy capital ships. This is primarily an anti-submarine vessel with an anti-aircraft role as well. So the hedgehogs are anti-sub units, the torpedoes, as we've just discussed, are all anti-submarine configured, and everything else aboard the ship is dual purpose. The three-inch guns are, okay, they can be dual purpose, but they're pretty much dedicated to anti-aircraft weapons, and the five-inch 54 was designed primarily to improve the anti-aircraft performance of the ship over the five inch 38. So the guns are for the air and everything else is for the subs. So let's go a little bit further aft and we'll have a look at where the other three inch used to be. So we've now moved further aft on the ship and we're actually at the level where the super firing aft five inch gun is a little bit more to my left, your right. But this nice wide open area is not as some might suspect, some landing space for helicopters or something like that, apart from anything, you've got a turret that way and the rest of the superstructure this way, plus random bits of uh, deck coming up. This is where the aft twin three inch mount would have been. Now, of course, this was removed later on in the ship service and presumably there aren't enough spares in US Navy inventory for them to put one back. So all that's left of the ship's three inch armament that you can directly access and see is this little circle just here in the deck, which hopefully is coming through in the pictures as well. That's where that mount used to sit. That's where it used to rotate. And uh, yeah, that's, that's all that's left of the ship's light anti-aircraft armament. The important thing you've got to remember about light and medium anti-aircraft armament is that it was an incredibly rapidly evolving thing. When the Forrest Shermans were designed, okay, it took about a decade between that design and this ship in particular coming into service, but back when they were designed at the end of the 1940s and the beginning of the 1950s, a decade earlier, the 50 caliber machine gun had been seen as a not fantastic, but acceptable anti-aircraft weapon. And of course that was supplemented by what was seen as the heavy automatic anti-aircraft weapon, the 1.1 inch quadruple mounting, which didn't work particularly well. But as time went on very rapidly in the early part of World War II, the 50 cal and the 1.1 inch were both replaced by the 20 millimeter Orlikon. However, by 1943, 1944, it was being appreciated that even the Orlikon was now being somewhat outranged by incoming attack aircraft and the distance that they could drop their weapons at. And so it was being supplemented by the Bofors 40 mil. By the end of World War II, the Orlikon, although it was present in large numbers aboard ships because it was still quite useful for taking out kamikazes, in terms of taking out enemy aircraft before they could actually deploy their weapons, the both Someone's just decided to start up a jet wash. In terms of being able to take out enemy aircraft before they dropped their weapons, the Bofors 40 mil was pretty much where it was at, and unfortunately, by the end of World War II, even the Bofors 40 mil was beginning to hit range limits when it came to that kind of scenario. And so very rapidly, the three inch was developed and that three inch was actually taking an older three inch weapon that the US Navy had had in service before World War II and reinvigorating it and redeveloping it as an auto-loading, auto-firing weapon. 
and that led to the three inch twin automatic mounts which were then widespread in immediate post-war US Navy ships like the Forrest Sherman or if you happen to be on the other side of the country and go and visit her the USS Salem which still has some of her original mounts in place. Right, so here we can see the aft two five inch guns. Obviously we've got the super firing one here up with us and you can see the roof of the second one down there. Now the location of these guns was not entirely popular at the time that they were designed. It was preferred amongst many in the US Navy to have a pair of super firing mounts forward as had been the case in pretty much all US destroyers for quite some time. And you know having only one gun forward people were thinking well if we have to chase down enemy ships just the one gun even if it is the equivalent or slightly better than a twin mount is not as good as uh, double the firepower. However, two things dictated the placement of the, these guns. Firstly, the bow narrowed quite quickly on the design and that meant that if you had two mounts forward, you were gonna have the magazines for the forwardmost mount dangerously close to the side of the ship. And bear in mind, of course, as a destroyer, although she might have STS steel sides, that's just splinter proofing and an HE shell of any significant caliber that hit, even if it didn't penetrate through the hull, which it probably still would, but even if it didn't, the spalling would pose a danger of a magazine detonation if the magazine's right next to the outer hull. Whereas by having the single mount forward, you could at least have some air gapping going on and maybe a couple of bulkheads as well. The other factor was, as we saw that big slope up, and if you have a quick pan back through the video or if I put a little picture over here on my right hopefully you'll notice that the forward mount already is on the slope the back of the mount is actually has a considerably larger gap underneath it than the forward part of the mount so you can imagine with that slope for the sea keeping of the ship if you had a pair of mounts so the one that's there at the moment would have been the super firing one so a bit higher the next mount forward would have been a really difficult one to position and they both would have ended up being considerably higher up thus adversely affecting the ship's stability because if we say take this one which we're next to if this is having to sit let's say four five feet above the deck just in order for the forward part of the mount to clear the deck as it rises up then you're also adding another four to five feet to the super firing position and well yeah that's when you go the way of the sims class and have to come immediately back into port to have something taken off to stop you rolling over and at the end of the day this mount is actually so far back that its forward arc of fire is not terrible i mean okay you can't fire dead forward into the rest of the ship but if the ship's pursuing an enemy that's maybe 15 20 degrees off of your port or starboard bow this gun at least is still going to be able to fire so you've still effectively got that uh, two gun or four five inch 38 equivalent firing forward granted the aft gun maybe not quite so much but even still you can probably see this part of the superstructure is actually curving in at an angle towards the center which will give that aft mount a degree of a head fire probably at maybe a 30 to 35 degree angle which is a surprisingly good forward fire arc for such an aft mounted weapon now here on the aft fantail, there is one more weapon system, although it's not really a weapon system so much as a defensive system. There was a weapon system on here, which is behind the camera, which was a rack of depth charges. Because of course you had the hedgehog launchers up front, but if you passed over a submarine contact while you were in the process of attacking them, you couldn't swivel the hedgehogs to fire back across the ship. So there was a single rack of depth charges for that purpose. But in the process of the ship's career, those have been removed. And unlike the twin three inch, where there's that faint evidence of its existence we saw earlier, there's literally nothing to show you other than some empty deck space on the fan tail. So you just have to take my word and maybe I'll put a picture in over somewhere here showing you where it was or what it looked like. This, however, is a towed array decoy system. So um, it has seen somewhat better days, that one at least. But as you can see, the idea of these is fairly simple. The ship has acoustic homing torpedoes for going after submarines. They already knew that submarines had acoustic homing torpedoes for going after ships. That had become clear about halfway through the Second World War. And so this system is a slightly more advanced version of an earlier system. And you sling it off the back, it's towed behind. And this means that obviously it can generate different noise profiles 
which means it can fool more advanced acoustic homing torpedoes, as opposed to if you see the video I did on Sackville, she was carrying a World War II era noise towed noisemaker, and that's literally just a miniature paravane with a couple of iron or steel bars attached to it that rattle and create a lot of racket. But it's a fairly steady, fairly single frequency racket, which even second gen acoustic homing torpedoes in the Second World War could figure out how to avoid. This is a much more sophisticated defensive system in that regard. Here's another view of the aft 5 inch. Now there's a few key details to pick up here. First of all you've obviously got this hatch here. Now this is to eject the shell casings on a more conventional ship, well a ship armed with more conventional guns, by a 5 inch 38 for the time period that the channel covers that would be ejected out the back but of course this is an auto loader so there's no person in there who's going to be reaching into the auto loading mechanism to grab shell casings so the shell casing will come out up here also and hopefully this is showing up on the camera if not i apologize and i'll try and take a close up and put it up somewhere if it isn't there is a little patch here and this is a battle damage repair patch when the ship was offshore during the vietnam war she was hit by enemy fire the shell came in punched through the deck, because of course it's not an armoured deck, blew up in the supply, supply room, but there wasn't anyone there, so you know, no, no one was injured um, or killed by the shell, but then they had to weld a patch over it all, so that patch is still visible as a discontinuity in the overall deck. And then finally, back when we were up front, I mentioned there used to be two domes, one for at surface spotting and one for air spotting, and you can see, as with the one up front, the ones after only still have the one dome. And contrary to what you might imagine, the dome that's left is not in fact the anti-air dome. Um, that is actually the surface spotting and control dome, because the dome over here on my right, your left, that would have been the air spotting dome and air tracking, but by about halfway through the ship's service career, it was appreciated that the modern aircraft that were beginning to potentially be going off the ship were now jet propelled. They'd be going at high subsonic or possibly even low supersonic speeds. And the systems that were in that time just were not set up to deal with that and couldn't be made to be set up to deal with that. And so the ship had to go over to fully radar tracking to deal with air threats. And so with that bit being redundant, it was taken out to save a little bit of weight because as with any ship that serves for any extended period of time, they had to add all sorts of extra systems and that was a few more tons they could remove to help with the ship's stability. All right, well, apologies for the portrait mode, but this is the only way you're gonna see all of the mechanisms, but we are now one deck below the aft mount, so the um, mount number three. And you can see here, this is part of the loading mechanism. So you can see the full length of the shell and then immediately below it in a slightly lighter colored brass bronze color is the charge. And that's going up the port side hoist. As you saw when we were up top in the mount, there are actually two hoists serving it because that's the only way to get all the shells and charges to it as quickly as possible. Just on the bottom left, you can see there's a charge case to keep the charge safe when it's not in use. And just to the right, you can also see an inert round sitting there waiting. Now, of course, this is one of the reasons why this is a mount and not a turret, because of course, if this was a turret, these shell hoists, which obviously go all the way down into the magazines, these would all be supplied with a barbette, but there is no barbette here. And that's part of what defines it as a mount. Right, well, I've had to switch over to the small handheld camera because this is inside of mount 5.3, so this is the aftermost mount. And you can see the auto-loading equipment has made this a very cramped space. If you go inside of one of the preserved 5-inch 38 twin mounts, there's plenty of room for lots of people to stand around and have a conversation because, of course, back in those days, there were over a dozen people in the mount itself. But as it is, ah, there's a viewpoint. This is the servicing machinery for the gun. You can see the uh, on either side we've got the loading mechanisms for the semi-fixed ammo coming up. And that's all feeding into the gun itself, which there's literally just about one person's width behind all of that. So that can 
to stick this in and hopefully you can see down there there's the breech of the 5 inch 54 and all of this is for loading the gun now here is one of those closed off portions so there's actually an artificially large amount of space on this side compared to what there would have been and again compared to 5 inch 38 map all of this extra power machinery uh, that's involved and now if we go back round again there is some uh, rules and procedures for the gun captain to follow and some buttons but if we keep going back around again more machinery we can see that on this side they actually have a shell and its charge loaded ready to go and of course there is the fuse setter for um, the shells fusing mechanical timed obviously if it's using VT fuse it just needs to be shut, turned on and then here with this seat that's folded away and it is now a little bit of a hazard to your head this is the mounting point if I can. as you can see this is a one-man control unit mark 4 assistant mount captain would sit here got even a little wiper defroster door heater because it's a enclosed position and this shows you all the equipment elevation indicators train indicators so this is where this gun would be controlled for one of its two possible firing modes, anti-surface or anti-air. And there's <laughs> even more machine. This is all the machinery you need for a fully remote powered, remote controlled and auto loading five inch mount. It's not designed to be particularly people friendly because there's not supposed to be that many people in here compared to, as I say, a five inch, whether that be a single or a twin. Some pressure to let you know if you've got pressure in the system and you can see this is all rather than having canvas or just open um, on the mounting for where the gun being elevated you can see we've also got this so this is, forms a solid seal to stop water getting in and shorting everything out gives you some idea also of the rate of play that this thing has so hopefully hopefully all that audio has come through and you can see what it's like in here. Let's move on, shall we? And now we've spent a bit of time in the upper portion of the ship, it's time for us to head down into the depths and see what we can see. Well, welcome everyone to aft steering. Apologize for the humming, but that's a transformer on the ship. There's not a lot I could do about that. But here you can see some of the machinery that actually steers the destroyer. And we are literally right at the back of the ship. So you can see this curvature of what looks to us like a rear wall that's the curvature of the transom stern so directly beneath us is water because obviously there's the overhang for the rudders and as you can see from the sign uh, we're facing aft at the moment so that's saying the left rudder is over here starboard rudder is over there that makes the ship quite agile and we've got all the powered machinery all the hydraulics and everything in here and then We've also got some nice big wrenches <laughs> for manual adjustment. Nice big levers there that will uh, attach. And as you can see with this one, you can see it's got these locking lugs. So that would go on here and that will allow you to make manual changes and corrections if you need to. <laughs> and another thing that's quite important that you'll see down here is this so this is damage control cabling so if power goes down in this area of the ship but you need power obviously to maintain the ship's ability to move you plug this in to some emergency damage control power points and then you can run that cable forward to an area where power remains and bypass the damage that's occurred to the main system and then of course there's also a ladder and you can go up there through the hatch that's up there as well if you have to if the ship's locked down for action station again apologies for the generator hum 
but uh, that is the bottom of the ship <laughs> you can see the framing and everything so down there are water pumps and motors to power them and up here we have auxiliary power obviously there's the um, switchboard and the generator and the transformer that's currently making the very loud buzzing noise but we also have an auxiliary diesel motor here which is part of the ship's power system and uh, well that's the transformer that's causing all the noise and over here in again we're still right aft we have a lathe this is the ship's machine shop such as it is obviously a somewhat smaller facility than you'd find on a larger vessel but nonetheless able to fabricate small parts ready for use aboard the ship if something should break and of course everything is able to be locked up we can see this is obviously a general quarters dash action stations only door closure so let's proceed elsewhere and coming through another section of the ship aft and this is obviously part of the crew quarters everybody's stacked three high and there is not a lot of room to maneuver and uh, well your personal effect personal effects go underneath in here this lifts up which can be quite interesting of course if you need to change something there's a in the middle of the night there is a little ventilator there so you can keep yourself a bit cool some boards commemorating the ship's actions of uh, Vietnam and here you see this is how one of those is laid out so we've got the various uniforms pretty much mostly uniforms and a few spaces of personal effects and a hatch going further down into the ship and personal lockers for anything you can't fit in under your bunk. Good. And here, this is for the super firing mount. This is mount 5-2. Again, you can see all the systems, all the motors needed to feed this up. So this isn't the ship's magazine. You know, there's no massive amounts of charges, etc., stored here, but the ammunition and uh, charges would come up from further down and this is just part of the mechanism which can then be serviced if anything should break which being a highly complex mechanical system inevitably it's more likely to break than some of the old systems simply because there is more stuff to go wrong and we're now proceeding into the ship's machinery spaces now this is a little bit different compared to other ships machinery you will have seen on previous tours not because it's um, particularly heavily modern unit we're still looking at geared turbines these are the reduction gears you can see they're in their case so and this is the obviously the turbines the low pressure and high pressure turbines all driving into the gear case which will then drive one of the ship's screws but one of the main differences about this set of machinery is that this is 1200 psi machinery so most of the machinery spaces you'll have seen in other u.s museum ship tours from world war ii era vessels are 600 psi units but this is a slightly more advanced system that was coming into use toward the end of world war ii and obviously immediately after twice the pressure which means it's also quite a lot more efficient although far far more, more lethal should something go wrong because at this stage of proceedings if you get a steam leak you're not going to notice until you wander into it and it cuts you in half um, which is why you walk around with a broom handle ahead of you apparently but uh, well you hopefully notice through the sounds and through all the systems going uh, berserk saying well something's gone horribly wrong uh, one of the other things that marks it out as a well if you were just looking at it in isolation either a very late war or post-war vessel is this this is a automatic degaussing system so this reduces the ship's magnetic signature and that means that if the ship passes near a magnetically induced mine or someone fires a torpedo with a magnetic detonator hopefully the ship won't trigger it which it would otherwise in a more conventional World War II setup which is why they had to invent degaussing rigs and so forth and here running along the side of the ship are the degaussing cables those are connected to the degaussing system we saw earlier and as you can see again we are right on the edge of the ship that's why these degaussing cables are attached and they go through 
and these will run the full circuit of the ship. Now as we come through that hatch or bulkhead door we are now in the boiler rooms themselves so we were previously in the engine rooms where they had the turbines that used the steam that were produced by these boilers. Again apologies but there is transformer buzz and these are obviously forced induction. There's a <laughs> don't put your head near there while it's active and these are the boiler units themselves so have a look in there. <laughs> you can see the reflection of the camera in uh, the plexiglass there. But yeah, this is what a 1200 psi steam boiler plant looks like, or at least part of it. And if you think, ah, well, this doesn't look too bad, well, bear in mind, we're on a gantry, and down there, on another walkway, so it looks like we can actually go down there. That's the lower part of the boiler. It comes all the way up here. So, there we go, we can actually, a little bit of a sailor's art there on the lagging. Oh, we could theoretically go down there, but it is a restricted area, so unfortunately we cannot. And it was at this point I remembered I had a small camera on the end of a very long stick, so I just lowered it down from the gantry and took a quick pan around so you can at least have a little bit of a look at what the lower portion of Turner Joy's engineering spaces look like while still respecting the ship's rules about, you know, people not actually going down there. And now, to give those of you who've served in the engineering department on a ship nightmares... <laughs> now again, if you want to see what the successor to the Mark I fire control system, which is found aboard various US battleships, etc. is, well, here we are, all nicely lit up. It's a little bit more electrical than electromechanical, but as you can see, there's still a fair amount of mechanical going on. Got various readouts. The stable element in unstable times. <laughs> Beads, and this is where people would sit to work out, as the labels say, target bearing, target elevation, target range. So this is only one level below the mess. There's only one level down in the ship. And that might seem a little bit odd to those of you who are used to US battle. What the? <laughs> that might seem a little bit odd for those of you who are used to battleships which have all of their systems well down below the waterline in armoured sections of the ship. But of course, this ship is not armoured, so there's not a huge amount of point in having this anywhere other than somewhere that's roughly splinter proof. So the Mark 47 computer, as you can see here, is just down here ready to go. And to cap everything off, we'll take a quick look around the bridge. As I mentioned when we were up here near the beginning, this is kind of actually a two section bridge. You've got the original bridge there on the right and this additional fared over portion, which was added a little bit later in the ship's life, if all accounts are to be believed. And if you look at photos of early Forest Shermans, you'll see that the bridge superstructure seems to take a step back rather than in the later ones where it seems to lean forward. And that's essentially because this is the open platform that gives that step back appearance. And then obviously with this new glazing, it seems to lean forward. One of the things that distinguishes this as a fairly new ship as far as the, where the channel covers, so you know it's a post-war vessel, is that a lot of the communications devices that you would normally find on a ship of the type that I would normally tour are not present. So lots of voice tubes, lots of single-use phone systems, etc. They're not entirely gone, but as you can see here, there is a, a multi-channel announcement dash PA dash communication system here, which compacts an awful lot of that into a single point. And part of the reason you'd need this area sheltered is obviously whilst, as you can see from the various buttons, dials, etc., this is still partly a mechanical system, but there's an awful lot more electromechanical and electrical systems present. And well, compared to binoculars and the basic model human, these things are a lot more sensitive to salt water. So you want to keep them relatively dry. But there is always a touch of the old school because ultimately technology can fail 
uh, the really old stuff tends not to unless it's been actively blown apart. So here is a voice tube on the right and to the left there you can see there is a small compass for navigation. And then you come inside to the original bridge and you can see there's another 1MC system up there at the top. Uh, steering position, radar screens and because this is the an older part of the ship compared to the newly enclosed outer part, you can also see up there on the left in the middle some more traditional brass and bake light phone systems and the like. And if you stick your head out of the bridge, look on this is the port side of the ship, you'll see a bunch of different antenna. Now, if you're wondering what these are, the up the top, the sort of dark grey hemi cylinder uh, is a direction finder dash receiver antenna, all part of the ULQ6 electronic countermeasure system. Then on the center section, you've got this kind of cylinder disc and box set up. That is the chaff rocket guiding antenna. So that will tell the chaff rockets which direction to fire if there's an incoming radar guided threat. And then right at the bottom, um, just above the kind of open negative space box, there is something that's a little bit difficult to see in this photo, admittedly, but that is the deception and jamming transmitter antenna. So full suite of electronic warfare devices, but obviously mostly planned to be built into the ship in a way that World War II ships that were fitted with a lot of these systems, either during the war in early versions or post-war in more advanced versions, were admittedly some more of a jury rig system. And then we pop back to the bridge for one last look at a rather interesting little system. And of course, absolutely have to say, fantastic visit, visit here to Turner Joy up here in Washington State, facilitated by the wonderful crew who actually run the ship. Uh, they actually had a separate event where they actually had serving Navy officers aboard as well. So we were able to work around them without disrupting everything. But, you know, if you happen to find yourself in the Bremerton area up there on the northwestern corner of the contiguous United States, then please do give Turner Joy a visit. It's an absolutely lovely ship. They've got a lot of stuff open. Uh, there's a lot more stuff that you haven't seen here, you know, details of the fire control equipment, details of the bridge, uh, several decks uh, of sort of the mid middling space, because remember we went from the upper decks where the guns are all the way down into the heart of the ship, and all of those spaces and more can be seen, plenty of information boards telling you how it works, and the ship itself is in, yeah, pretty good condition, especially considering they're having to fight the endless swarms of seagulls and her herons for the... Uh, cleanliness of the vessel so uh, it's a bit of a thankless job but they are doing it very very well in keeping it clean mostly clean of all of that kind of stuff and of course she is the last of her class she is also the last of the US Navy destroyers that would carry lots of guns relatively speaking and so we'll round off by well not using this although this is you can see is the collision alarm this doesn't actually do anything you can flip the switch but all you get is a slight metallic click. The one on the left, however, the red one, that does work. So once again, as with the, the engineering alarm you heard earlier, if you have served on a warship before, where, well, your autonomic responses may kick in in a few seconds, so you may want to hit mute because we're about to go to general quarters. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.